Okay, I know Death Stranding was released after Metal Gear Solid V, and maybe some folks will balk at me trying to compare the games at all. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna do it. If you take all this process gain from Metal Gear Solid V and apply it to Death Stranding, you unlock a whole layer of meaning for understanding that game's narrative. And then if you take that understanding from Death Stranding back to Metal Gear, that will unlock even more new stuff for you to think and talk about. So without further ado, let me spell out my way of interpreting Death Stranding. Given what I've revealed here so far about the motion picture influences at work throughout Kojima's Metal Gear series, and the fact that these influences and inspirations have been explicitly a part of the game's story elements from the very first game's making, I think it's appropriate to introduce this fourth section of the video series with another pop culture sensation that aired on television in the 1970s. The Six Million Dollar Man starred Lee Majors as Steve Austin, a U.S. Air Force pilot who is injured in a plane crash. Austin is rebuilt with bionic implants to replace his lost legs, arm, and eye, granting him super speed, strength, and vision. In several ways, Venom Snake is an explicit reference to the Six Million Dollar Man. The sound effect found in the TV show when Steve Austin uses his powers to run fast or crush an object is the same sound effect that plays when Venom executes the running punch on an enemy soldier. Venom has been blown up in a crash and then rebuilt, and this process also granted him extra abilities. Steve Austin in the TV show works for a secret spy organization known as OSI, which carries more than a few parallels to Cypher. The show was a big success at the time, and it was one of the first TV productions to make a foray into the world of many kinds of special effects that had only been seen on film up to that point, most notably slow motion, which is present in V with reflex mode. The show's success was great enough to spawn a spin-off series starring Lindsay Wagner, known as the Bionic Woman. The spin-off started during the Six Million Dollar Man show when an episode introduced Lindsay's character, Jamie Summers, a tennis pro and old flame of Steve Austin's who happens to meet back up with him in their hometown where he's been living and working on his parents' property. In a cruel twist, the pair goes skydiving and Jamie's parachute malfunctions, causing her to land in a tree and receive mortal wounds from the fall. Steve begs his OSI superior to give Jamie the surgery that he got to save his life, and they agree. Jamie has a hard time at first adapting to her new reality, but she finds a way to cope with the help of Steve who had already been through the same process. On a surface level, this shared transformation relates back to what I mentioned with Paws and Chico undergoing the same type of transformation. Jamie's new legs grant her the same super speed like Steve. She loses hearing in one ear from her fall, so she's given a bionic ear, enabling her to eavesdrop on whispered conversations from several meters away, or even to hear into an adjacent room through the wall. And of course, Lindsay Wagner is also the likeness of Bridget and Amelie. Compare how Amelie is like a younger version of Bridget, to how Paws is a younger version of the Joy. And consider how Amelie's voice differs from Bridget, but she has the same face, just like Kiefer's snake and Hater's snake. Compare Sam to V. Sam is a delivery boy, and we know that every snake is a delivery boy in some way. Solid carries Fox Die, Raiden carries his memes, and Fox carries his parasites. Many of the added Cyberpunk 2077 deliveries Sam can do in Death Stranding are addressed to V, as if Sam is the V to the J of Jackie from Cyberpunk, who's emailing Sam these requests. Compare this ghost of Jackie from Cyberpunk to the ghost of Naked Snake Jack, that Venom constantly has to contend with during the Phantom Pain. Compare the multiple Sams to the multiple Foxes I've described earlier. Consider that Higgs and Ocelot's voices might be the same to forge a link between those characters. Indeed, Ocelot does lose one hand at Shadow Moses, and that also happens to be the same right hand Zadornov lacks, recalling Higgs' own lost hands. Higgs even has two Kipus in mirrored positions to the two revolvers Ocelot typically carries. His golden skull mask might be a hint that Higgs is Ocelot taking on the role of Skullface to Sam's snake for Death Stranding's scenario, in Metal Gear terms. There are indeed five required BT sub-boss encounters in the game, with Higgs at Portnot, then at Mama's, then the Tar Belt Crossing, followed by the Goliath, and then finally the Whale. Compare those five to the Skull Fights in V, or the five Cobra sub-bosses, and so on. Higgs might be Revolver Ocelot undercover, and Sam could be Gray Fox. Bridges seems an awful lot like an alternate version of Cypher the Organization. Cliff appears to have a lot in common with the Sorrow. 
Bridget seems analogous to the boss herself, and thus Amelie compares to Paws, while Fragile is more analogous to Quiet. It seems Paws' character has been split across these other entities, maybe as a result of her being exploded during her transformation. Compare her exploded nature to the exploded parts of Camp Omega reconstructed in the Phantom Pain's landscapes that I described earlier. Recall that Higgs caused one bomb to detonate, destroying a city that Fragile is blamed for? And then Fragile sacrifices her body to scuttle the second bomb that Higgs tries to set off, with her efforts getting the bomb clear of innocent bystanders, but costing her personally. Compare that to the two bombs Paws carries in Morpho, and how one is found, but the second one is detonated outside of the compartment at the cost of Paws' body. And indeed, if Skullface had left Camp Omega to go to the US, then someone else in his scheme must have been at MSF's base with a remote trigger to detonate Paws' bomb at the appropriate time. Maybe that was Ocelot in his own chopper, since Higgs is the one responsible for Fragile's bombs. I don't think it's necessarily just as simple as one-to-one -one comparisons between these characters, however. Amelie is one aspect of Paws in a way, but Amelie is also the face that the Extinction Entity wears, and there's also the white-dressed Amelie on Sam's beach that he sees before his reconnection with Dead Man and BB. It seems like Amelie is a face or role that is put on by a Ka in certain situations while on the beach. Perhaps Amelie is the mask worn by some Ka's on the beaches of Death Stranding while their Ha is still alive in the world or not present on the beach. If the Ka is the user, then Amelie is just the role or avatar, not the entity itself. Perhaps this explains the different colored dresses we see Amelie in. Those might be different Ka's inhabiting the same container. Maybe Paws only has a link to the red Amelie, and the dark blue EE one is linked to another character. The white dressed Amelie appears to be the mother archetype from Metal Gear, standing in for the mothers we already know, like the Joy and Olga, as those who wore white represent. I'm looking at you, Otacon. Red Amelie is like the Maiden, White Amelie is the mother, and Blue Amelie is the crone, or the old woman. The three archetypal aspects of woman as youth, adult, and elder line up with these three images of Amelie. They are also the three fates. There are several layers of interpretation that fit here from this perspective. Each character in Death Stranding is like a superimposition of several other characters from Metal Gear from this way of seeing. Sam's life events align with Chico and Venom's and Gray Fox's life events, but also Solid Snake's and Raiden's. We see Sam as a child being comforted by Amelie, the same way Paws comforted Chico in his cell at Camp Omega. Remember Paws and Chico's time at MSF on the beaches? Also recall how Otacon comforted Solid Snake in his cell. Compare what we read of Sam and Lucy's relationship to Raiden and Rose. We see Sam as a man holding a baby version of himself, like how Null was responsible for the young Chico's creation, and Sam and Cliff's scenes call back to Snake's speech to Raiden at the end of the Big Shell incident. Nearly every scene and element in Death Stranding can be related directly to a scene or scenario or something found in Metal Gear. How different is Kyrillium from the Parasites? The idea of a substance that represents artifice itself has many forms and is indeed older than either Death Stranding or Metal Gear. And remember in a previous video how I described a method of using time travel to establish a base in the far future to send projects and computing power there to harness it instantaneously in the present and how all that is exactly how the chiral network operates? PT is part of this too. Norman Reedus is Sam in PT. He's Chico in the middle of his transition between these two worlds, undergoing a metaphorical post-death transition as he leaves his human self behind and undergoes parasite therapy. The PT teaser trailer which featured Chico's head supports this interpretation. The world of Death Stranding is like an afterlife where Sam has a certain task to accomplish, which lines up with descriptions of the afterlife found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Lisa is also a character in both PT and Death Stranding, Sam's mother and Cliff's wife, so Cliff is then, from this perspective, probably kind of an amalgamation of the father personalities we see throughout Metal Gear. He's Chico's father. He's Zero. He's Campbell. He's the Sorrow. He's every father in Metal Gear superimposed in one character. Compare the trench coats worn by Cliff and Zadornov, Gene, Old Snake, and others that originated with Gillian Seed and Snatcher. 
The idea of each character in Death Stranding being a superimposition of character roles found in Metal Gear as a way of reaching archetypes bears itself out when you apply it to other characters in the other aspects of Death Stranding's mythology. The Death Stranding itself is a superimposition of every apocalyptic myth we have. It's the Great Flood, it's the Book of Revelations, it's Ragnarok, and it's also the heat death of the universe to represent our view of science's myth. It's a layering of every one of these and more, all presented in a singular form to be more easily understood and to better represent today's evolving world. So these characters from Metal Gear are here in Death Stranding sort of reimagined from a different angle in symbolic form, with several characters superimposed to form one unified archetype. So Bridget isn't just the boss, she's the old woman, meaning she's Big Mama too. Mama in Death Stranding is representative of the female body, and Lochna is symbolic of the female spirit. Mama does the hardware, and Lochna handles software. Deadman and Heartman also share this kind of body-spirit duality, where Deadman represents the male body, and Heartman the male spirit. Consider how Deadman is just a haw, and how Heartman's cause constantly leaving his body to go to the beach. Sam then isn't just one specific guy, Grey Fox, or just the protagonists of Metal Gear, he's also every person, or really the archetype of the everyman, which really isn't a male gendered person, I prefer the term universal person. It's a person who represents all of humanity symbolically. So Sam is every man, and every woman, and everyone else too, and this bears itself out when you look at his Bridges support crew as an extension of himself. He has four helpers, Mama and Lochna, the female sides of him, and Deadman and Heartman, the male sides. Sam is both mother and father, and the way his relationship with BB is characterized also supports that idea. He's also parent and child, which I'll elaborate more on in a bit. Consider how Lochna is the leader of Mountain Knot and the region, and how every delivery point around there has a woman present. Mountains are often used as a symbolically feminine geographic feature with the obvious connections of slopes and peaks. One set of deliveries is even directly pertaining to a pregnant mother at the Mountaineer's location. Consider how during this section of story, Sam is traveling without BB attached. If Sam is both the mother and father, then while BB is inside with Dead Man, the symbolic male body literally inside the mountains representing female spirit? This formulation represents Sam exploring his feminine spiritual side in a literal sense while his male body is sublimated. And with BB being internalized with his symbolic body during this part, it likens Sam to a newly expectant mother-to-be. Compare how Sam talks to an absent BB in this part of the game and how a mother will begin to talk to her child in the womb. Contrast that region with the areas around Lake Knot City to the northeast. There are men at nearly every delivery point until you get to the chiral artist or the cosplayer down south near to Mama, where the geography would presumably be shifting from symbolically male space to symbolically female areas as you near Mama's lab. The nearby waterfall seems like an obvious feminine symbol from this perspective, and indeed even the Timefall farm has a woman present. So then if the east portions of the central region of this map stand in for the body symbolically, the western portions of this map stand in for the spirit. And the furthest north are the most symbolically male spaces on the map, while we get into the more female geography the further south we go. This could explain why Hartman's Lake is so far south. His spirit resides firmly with his deceased wife, so his heart lake being placed in the far sides of the female spiritual terrain makes sense. Then proceeding further southwest past Hartman's lab, things start to get less binary and gendered and more about life in general from a temporal perspective. The last preppers are the geologist, the evo-devo biologist, and the paleontologist. So that means these areas must represent the life that came before humans, and eventually this area terminates in the far south with a cross-like structure. This cross suggests a world nadir symbolism, suggesting this location stands for the source of life itself on Earth. In some mythologies, you see this type of location represented by a world tree, and yet there are areas beyond this cross that Sam has to traverse before he finishes his story. So what came before life? Well, that would be the realm of death, or of the non-living. That's why there's a big BT area immediately south of this cross and then the big tar belt. 
This tar belt represents the boundaries of existence itself in a way, and Sam crossing it is akin to going to before the primordial state that existed before creation sprang forth, however it did, whenever it did. From there we have to answer the question of what the central region stands in for as a whole in order to understand what's happening symbolically when Sam crosses that tar belt and leaves the central region to arrive in Edgenot for the final conflict with Higgs in his reunion with Amelie. In order to answer that, we also need to answer what the eastern region stands for so that we can compare it to the central and edge regions to get a good idea of the big picture here. And just to save time, I'll dive right in. The eastern region of Death Stranding's world and the story there serves as a metaphor for the game's industry and the game making process. Sam himself is symbolic of the game Death Stranding being made and sent out into the world of life and humanity, represented by the central region in its whole extended metaphor, and finally arriving at the game's inevitable terminal point represented in the last fight between Higgs and Sam. To go one location at a time, Capital Knot stands for the biggest publishers and studios. This is Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo, and also Activision, EA, Capcom, Konami, Bethesda, and so on. The ones who own the biggest, most influential IPs and gaming systems. The first way station north of Capital Knot stands for the smaller indie publishers and developers, and funnily enough, Kojima Productions itself. The Ludens fan, Jeff, who isn't part of Bridges, stands in for the influencers who aren't strictly part of the game's making apparatus, but still play a role in the whole process. Next up is the Distro Center, which stands for online games distribution platforms, and primarily I think of Steam and Valve when I think of this place, but you can also include the other marketplaces where you can buy games like Epic Game Store and PlayStation and Microsoft's online stores. Then off from there is the Wind Farm. Wind is symbolic of spoken words, so the Wind Farm is where they harvest spoken words. In other words, the Wind Farm is where gamers make their voices heard to game developers, whenever and wherever that happens. Think of the Wind Farm as Twitter. Does that explain why it's so scary now? There's also the musician near here, who represents both musicians and other talented artists who don't strictly make games, but whose art ends up in games. And finally, Port Knot stands for where shipping happens, or really physical stores and distribution services that sell consoles and games to customers. Sam's journey through these places is analogous to the journey a game makes while it's being made, and his leaving that region is like the game's release. So now that we've got the central and eastern regions covered, what about Edgenot and its whole thing? Well, considering the conflict that plays out there and everything else symbolically represented so far, the only thing left would be the world of principles and ideas themselves, as those things don't really need time or space or life or humans really even to be what they are. So this western region probably represents a world outside of time, and I think that's why it's got so many comparisons you can make to LA and Hollywood going on in both its suggested location in the game and its appearance. This is the world of the completely artificial, really like a realm where ideas are born and die. Sam has to fight Higgs here as a representation of everything the game has gone through in the minds and hearts of people who have played it, superimposed into one timeless artificial arena at the end of everything. If Sam is the universal person, then it makes sense as to why he has the relationships with Cliff and Bridget that he does. Bridget is his symbolic mother, and Cliff is his literal father. Given that Sam is the universal person, then that puts Cliff and Bridget in a kind of godly position as parents of all creation. Sam delivers himself and is directly involved in his own birth, just as man first created the idea of archetypes and the hero and the self. So here, Sam is the father and the son, and Cliff is kind of both the father and a grandfather, or perhaps godfather. If you pay close attention to the scene where Cliff is shot and speaking to BB in its pod, when Die Hard Man kneels down to pick up Cliff while a Bridges soldier grabs the BB pod, Cliff magically gets BB out of the pod into his hand. In one moment, Cliff is talking to BB in the pod, and in the next, the pod is empty and BB is in his arms. Cliff never opens the pod. It's as if someone invisible was there watching this birth happen and teleported BB out of the pod into Cliff's arms without anyone noticing. We see this invisible person right in front of us. It's Sam. When the memory of Cliff's death that Sam experiences at the incinerator ends, the scene fades back up to the already opened BB pod on the ground and a lifeless BB in Sam's arms. 
Sam is the one who takes himself out of the pod, and his future action of opening Luis's pod retroactively opens his own pod and puts himself into Cliff's arms in the past, since Sam's actions at the furnace symbolically place him as the father now. He truly does deliver himself. Amelie's aspects of old woman, mother, and maiden are reflected perfectly in Cliff as old man, Sam as father, and BB as son. If you consider the version of BB in the pot is also Sam. Lucy is Sam's deceased wife and was to be the mother of his child, so it makes sense that it's her being represented by the Amelie in white on Sam's beach at the end, urging him not to give up. The photo of Lucy that Sam carries throughout the game is there on the beach with him, and perhaps that photo was a totem for her spirit to connect with Sam on that beach to tell him that message at the end and help him reconnect with the living once more. And since Luis was going to be the name of their child, and BB28 ends up named Luis, given what all I've discussed here, it makes sense that the two have a symbolic connection, and thus a literal connection in the workings of the game. BB stands for the archetypal child, so perhaps BB28 is somehow literally Luis's cough from the past. This could mean that Luis is a repatriate just like Sam, which further reinforces the universal person idea Sam himself is described by, if Luis is somehow to inherit that tradition as an extension of Sam. Speaking of repatriates, now that we've seen the Death Stranding 2 trailer, I think it's safe to say that Fragile is probably also a repatriate. And symbolically, Fragile stands in for the body of woman in Death Stranding's overarching symbolic structure, especially if you consider that her presence in the narrative doesn't really gear up until after Mama's death as if Fragile is replacing Mama as the symbolic connection to the female body for Sam on his bridge's staff. In a way, Luis delivers herself much like Sam does. Her repatriation loop is actually shown to us when Sam first voids out with BB-28 and they wake up on the beach. As Sam holds the BB and cries, it disappears from his arms and leaves Tar like a BT. That moment syncs up almost perfectly with the moments of the ending at the furnace with BB's disappearance on Sam's beach matching Lou's waking up at the end. BB disappearing from Sam's arms and crawling into the water herself represents Louise taking herself back to life in the same way Amelie taking Sam's body into the scene brings him back to life after he's shot. Sam's revival of BB at the furnace syncs up with the repatriation scene's timing with the disappearance on the beach occurring at the same moment as Luis wakes up in Sam's arms at the furnace, implying that after Luis leaves from Sam's arms and crawls into the water, she finds the kipu in the water and then comes back to life. And if I'm right about all of that, then Sam's gonna have his hands full as a single parent of a repatriate. The kid's already an adrenaline junkie. I really hope he and Fragile tied the knot, because he will definitely need help. To go further into how repatriation works, I think when a person dies in Death Stranding's world, their Ha and Ka split, and normally the Ha stays where it died while the Ka goes to the beach. Eventually the Ha will undergo necrosis if it isn't incinerated, and this causes the Ka to become linked to that Ha's location. Incinerating the dead has an effect of putting the Ka to rest and sending it to the other side, while a body left alone will result in a Ka not at rest and connected to that spot where the body decayed until someone like Sam could come along and put that BT to rest via other methods. But when a repatriate like Sam dies, something different happens. His Ha disappears and goes to the beach. This happens because when Sam was first shot and killed as a BB, Amelie immediately recognized it as a mistake and used Cliff to catch Sam's Ha before it went to the other side and deliver it back to her beach. So this is why Cliff has his own scar at his navel and can repatriate on beaches in his own way, and why he's hell-bent on getting his BB back. She probably also made him into a type of repatriate. Eventually, Cliff completes his mission in that hospital right before he bleeds out, when he has his conversation with Sam and passes BB back and forth and gives Sam his dog tags. This forms a connection between Cliff's and Sam's beach, so that Cliff can now deliver Sam's wounded baby Ha from there, on the floor, to Amelie's beach, where Amelie shows up and heals the wound. The trick here is that she also places a doll in Sam's stomach here, as a totem to connect him to her beach permanently so that he's pulled back to her beach when he dies again instead of passing elsewhere. You can see this doll is in Sam's belly at the very beginning of Death Stranding if you huck him off the first cliffs. The doll is there instead of a live BB. You can also see evidence of two separate camera perspectives in the Memories of Sam's Hospital episode, where one camera is obviously from BB's eyes, 
and the second looks to be at the level of BV's navel, as if there was a camera in Sam's belly in that wound. So when Sam has that doll put in his belly and he's taken out into the waters of the seam and let go, he's not actually passing on to the other side. It gets pretty complicated, but inside the seam is actually a copy of the entire world, and what Sam sees in the seam when he's killed is a copy of the local area where his body was. The seam is actually a beach that exists sort of at the end of time, but is also outside of time. I may not fully have wrapped my head around this concept yet, but from what I understand, this is like a place in the far future, like Chrono Trigger's end of time, where the past exists as a sort of hologram inside these waters of the seam. Things that happen on these beaches have a kind of permanence to them, since whatever happens in the past doesn't undo what happens here. This is why Sam's body teleports when he dies. In a way, he doesn't have a ka except for the player's own input. He's kind of just a ha that's been resurrected via this doll inside his belly. The crazy part is that when he's carrying BB, because of Death Stranding's world's whole deal, BB is symbolically the same thing as that BB doll inside of him, so when Sam dies, BB becomes that doll inside of him while he's in the scene. Sam's ka is us and the player's control is shifted over when he dies to what I assume is a cryptobiote in the scene, floating and swimming around that we jack into and then guide into Sam's mouth. So the cryptobiote transfers the player's caw back to Sam via this whole process. And when Sam is revived, he's then shunted out of the scene and teleported back in time to where and when he died. And the game continues. Every time Sam dies, he replays this loop of his death and getting dumped back in the scene, and BB has its own place built into that process since the beginning because of the doll that Amelie put there originally. Did you get all that? So now we come to the question of Die Hard Man. What does he represent in this equation if he's not really the father, or the son, or any other type of archetype like that? Well, I think the answer could be in his name. Die Hard Man was a nickname given to him, and he says it's because he wouldn't die on all the missions he was ever sent out on. If you look further, however, you'll notice his real name is John McClane, which is the same name as the Bruce Willis character from the film Die Hard. In Death Stranding's universe, John was probably born on or near July 22, 1988, the premiere date for Die Hard in theaters. So if his father named him after a movie that was popular at the time, and then he was later nicknamed after that same movie, it makes sense that Die Hard Man's thing is the times. He's the spirit of the times. He is the characterization of our popular movements in modern society. I think this is why he wears the Luden's mask for most of the story, because it's really the times that are the primary driving force behind our real world today and the story depicted in Death Stranding. It's also a Skullface quote from The Phantom Pain about man's thirst for revenge driving the times. That's probably why he has the Luden's mask and why in the flashbacks it was Bridget wearing the mask. She was in charge and now he is. So the Luton's mask is like a mark of authority or power worn by someone who is driving the status quo. I think this is where the play angle comes in with Luton's. Those who lead in this way can sometimes be accused of playing with other people's lives if they act rashly and make poor decisions. But those who find novel ways of leading people to new horizons can also be said as playing with fate in their own way. And then finally that leaves Higgs. If it isn't glaringly obvious yet, Higgs is playing the devil archetype in this scenario. Or really, he's like the trickster, to use another word for the role. Sort of an agent of a power greater than himself. By the end of the story, once Higgs is beaten, Cliff really becomes this devil archetype, symbolized by Cliff acquiring and wearing the Luton's mask during the end section of the game. Higgs is the counterpart of Sam, having been a porter before he became a terrorist, and so Higgs gives us a view of the devil as one would view a friend turned rival, or even a mirror of oneself. Since Sam is the universal person, he's also a sort of mirror aspect of the devil character, and really of all the cast of Death Stranding. We're shown a story in Death Stranding that we know innately. The story of a once broken man putting the pieces of his life back together and making something constructive out of it, instead of allowing circumstance and the times to dictate the whole of his life. It's a story of remembrance, and of forgiveness and of the power and timelessness of the connections we forge with each other and our own selves in life. There's a lot more interpretation that can be brought to Death Stranding in Metal Gear via this methodology, and I don't want to rob anybody of that adventure of self-discovery. 
Once you start to see things in Metal Gear from the perspective I've laid out here, it works like a cipher for decoding a lot of the more mysterious elements of Death Stranding's story and world, and indeed the rest of Metal Gear. So I won't go into detailing every last thing and every last secret right here, right now. I wanted to lay out the foundations of what I see as a great series of interconnected works that Kojima has been crafting his entire career as a game maker. Having all this new perspective for looking at these games and their stories has certainly reinvigorated my desire to play them and enjoy their worlds, and indeed I hope these videos have done the same for you. But not yet. It's not over yet.